Honored tonight to introduce Roxanne Gay, New York Times contributor and best-selling author of Bad Feminist, Difficult Woman, Hunger, IET, in an, in an Untamed State. She is also the author of World of Wakanda and has several forthcoming books, as well as television and film projects. In addition to being an amazing writer and allowing all of us to enter her world where we can talk honestly about identity, being imperfect, and thinking hard about privilege and acceptance, she's also an amazing cook, which she shows on her Instagram. Her newest work, The Selected Works of Audre Lorde, showcases Audre Lorde's incredible contributions to intersectional feminism, queer theory, and critical race studies in 12 essays and over 60 poems. Tonight, she will be in conversation with um, Alexis Duveau, who is a writer, speaker, and activist. She was also the winner of the 2015 Lambda Literary Award for Lesbian Fiction and author of Warrior Poet, a biography of Audre Lorde. Please help me welcome them to PMP Live. Hello. Hello. Hi. Are you at home? I am in New York. Yes. I okay. yes. I'm at my wife's house. Wonderful. Wonderful. Where well, are it's you? Great to meet you. I am at home also. I'm in New Orleans. I moved here with my spouse about three and a half, going on four years now. And we have had the grace of not having a hurricane hit us yet. Yes, I saw that, which was especially now so welcome to see that the hurricane passed. I think Louisiana's had enough of hurricanes for a lifetime. Absolutely. I think um, the planet has had some serious hurricanes. So it's been Louisiana, it's been New York, it's been mm -hmm. Texas, it's been Puerto Rico. Um, you know, we have to really think about what is happening with and to the planet. Yes. Uh, I don't know. I, online today, I saw a graphic that showed how drastically the weather had changed in Colorado. It went from 90s to snow. Yeah. And then, of course, in California, where we live most of the time, um, it wildfires. Uh, the planet is definitely telling us something, and I don't know that many of us are listening. Yeah, which is why I think it's really amazing that we're going to have this talk about Audre Lorde mm -hmm. and her work and how we got to do our work in relation to her to uh, be able to create a biography of her um, and also this amazing reader that you put together um, that really crystallizes Lord's work. And to be able to have this conversation right now in 2020, as we're just really days basically mm -hmm. away from this next iteration of a president of the United States and these multiple pandemics that we're going through in this country and globally so I really just want to say that I'm, I'm really honored to, to be with you this evening and to talk with you and to share perspectives. Likewise, likewise. I'm looking forward to the conversation. I think there's a lot to talk about. You know, I, right now it's the election, really. I don't know what there is to talk about beyond the election because so much is at stake. And yeah. Audre Lorde just... Audre Lorde really just, um, unfortunate, her work is timeless and unfortunately it still applies uh, more than ever, I would say. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. I think, um, and maybe we could talk a little bit now about how um, you came to do this reader and I came to do the biography of Lorde. Absolutely. Now, um, I think like some 16 years old now and to kind of think about what that means in the schema of, of Lord's work and our work. Mm -hmm. uh, I came to the project by way of the estate. The estate approached me um, and said that they would like to assemble a new reader of Lord's work. And I was 
truly, you know, people say this, but I meant it. I was truly humbled because it was really unexpected. And so I said yes immediately. I didn't care what the money was. I didn't care about anything. I just said yes, because it gave me an opportunity to reread pretty much her entire body of work and to really have a greater understanding of the legacy into which I'm writing, into which we're both writing. And um, so it was just an opportunity. And it was a really, you know, I think I got more out of it than the book got out of it because I had this chance to chew, sit with her work and decide, okay, when you look at a writer's entire body of work, what do you include? Yeah, that's so interesting, Roxanne, because I was also approached by the estate. Mm -hmm. um, by that, I mean, I received a call from Gloria Joseph in 1994. And I actually thought it was a prank. <laughs> so I hung up on Gloria, whom I knew, but I thought it was a prank. And um, then she called back and she was like, no, listen, and this is what we want to do. And we want you to do it. And I was likewise dumbfounded mm -hmm. because my first thought was, what is there possible, what is possible to say about Audrey Lord, who said so much about herself? Mm -hmm. So what could I possibly bring to any narrative around her life? And that really, you know, stunned me for the first year or so of the project. It actually took 10 years to put that biography together. Wow, so, that was my oh, question. Yeah. How long did it take you to yeah. write this? And actually, what approach did you take to writing this? Because she lived a huge life and she accomplished a great deal. And so in many ways, you know you can't get it all down. So what did you prioritize? Um, I think, as you said in your introduction to the, to the reader, I wanted to get at an Audrey Lord that was not known. In a, in a sense. And mm -hmm. I had been asked by Gloria Joseph to, to humanize Audre Lord. And it took a while to understand actually what that meant, coming mm -hmm. to this extraordinary life. But mm -hmm. I began to have a, an understanding of Lord as having lived two lives, mm -hmm. at least. One, um, up until 1977, when she was dealing with the possibility of breast cancer, and another that began in 1978, 77, 78, after her mastectomy. Mm -hmm. So that, I think, was crucial to my approach, of uh, really trying to understand what Audrey Lord had gone through physically, yes. and how that physicality was shaped by something that we call a disease, mm -hmm. something that we call cancer. So I think that that was really, really important for me to, to one, uh, come to Audre Lorde as a human being, greater than life, certainly, but still human, Black woman. Yes. And two, to understand, to try to understand, to try to present how this disease then shaped her life. Yes. Then shaped her desires, shaped her activism, shaped her sense of herself as what I understood as, I, as an itinerant preacher, shaped her sense of herself as a global personality. And I think that's so important because we tend to take black women and treat them as if they're superhuman. And especially with a writer like Lord, people recite the most delectable bits of her work and the lines that are powerful without talking about everything around those amazing lines and giving themselves and the people who, that they're in conversation with like a full appreciation of what Lord was actually doing and saying in her work. And as you know, she was human. And one of the things I noticed uh, when I was reading through her work is just 
how much of her humanity comes out in her work, especially uh, when she talked about desire and sex as a black lesbian. Uh, she didn't shy away from it. And she was very interested in her body and the pleasures that could be taken not only from her body, but from that of her lover. And um, I think it's important not to, it's not that I want to say overly val valorized, but she's not a deity. She's a person. And I think that it's a, um, you give someone real respect when you do treat them as a person. Yeah, yeah. I think, um, too, the way you put the reader together makes it clear that you understand that there was a context for each one of these essays and, and the, the numbers of, of poems that you take mm -hmm. from Lord's collections, especially those collections that might not be available anymore, like uh, From a Land Where Other People Live, Between yeah. Ourselves, The First Cities, these early works uh, that were published either by women's presses or uh, like From a Land Where Other People Live was published by Broadside Press, which was a black press um, at the time. So I think it's really important. And I'm hoping that you'll talk a little bit about how you um, structured this reader. Yes. In terms of the structure, I work with my editor at Norton. And for the prose, I knew what I wanted to do with the prose and the order I wanted, to be, especially because it was a smaller selection. With the poetry, I just thought, how, I think I had some of the same questions you did when you sat down to write her biography. How do you capture someone's life? And for me, it was, how do you capture a very significant body of work? Um, and so I thought chronology, show how she evolved as a poet and an artist uh, over the years. And so it starts with her first collection in 1968, and then it ends up with um, uh, the Marvelous Arithmetics of Distance in 1993. And that was such an amazing span of time, 25 years. And uh, it really worked. Uh, instead of trying to go thematically, um, you know, like rage, desire, mm -hmm. black mm -hmm. womanhood, you could definitely do that. But I thought there was a more interesting arc in terms mm -hmm. of chronology. And because of what you noted, um, before cancer and after cancer. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. also see that effect in her work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was thinking too, like, how the work really helps us to un understand the 1970s and the 1980s, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and to some extent the 1990s, as lived experiences for Lord and for um, her peers and for the women, especially Black women, especially Black queer women, that she was able to articulate realities around how she really in the 1970s breaks out. And th this is, I, I think the 70s were actually Lord's breakout decade. Absolutely. Although she was, you know, working throughout the 60s, throughout the 80s, certainly in the 80s, she, she has a much more international persona, but the 70s I was particularly interested in, just in terms of her coming to terms with an embodied Black lesbian self. And I was wondering if, you know, in, in the reader, if you also kind of understood that or, or understood something different. You know, I think I did understand that because so much, especially of her work in the 70s, did speak to the Black woman's condition. Yeah. And it really was the height of her work. And one of the things I really focused on in my introduction was her 1979 letter to Mary Daly. Right. And if there was ever one piece of her work that really, I think, encapsulated her mission, it was that letter. Because she wasn't she wasn't messing around and instead of sort of being passive aggressive she took her concerns directly to mary daly mm -hmm. and said what you're doing here is erasing black women from the narrative and um how can we um have a more radical feminism when you're leaving 
a significant population of women behind. Mm -hmm. And I, I really admire her for holding Mary Daly accountable. There was a lot at stake in doing something like that. And she did it anyway. And we see that in a lot of her work, especially for me in the prose as a pro, well, yeah, I don't write poetry. As a prose writer, um, it, it can be terrifying to hold people accountable and to say the uncomfortable thing that people don't want to hear or to say the truth that people don't want to face. Uh, and we see that in terms of the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house and the uses of anger um, and sexism and American disease and blackface. Uh, she, she just never stopped. And two of those uh, essays were written in 1979. She did a lot in 1979. Uh, and throughout the 70s, I, I, you know, she wrote um, The Transformation of Silence into Language into in 1977. Um, it was a very busy decade. And so the letter to Mary Daly for me was just like this, um, this example of just how she could use her power when she wasn't writing just for herself. And, you know, when you look at her work, you can see glimpses of that too in her prose, in her poetry, that she's writing beyond the self, but she's also writing deeply personal work. Her work was intimate. Her work mm -hmm. was very much about centering her subject position, but she was not only doing that, uh, which is, uh, I think, something that a lot of us can certainly take note of and um, learn from. Yes, I, I totally agree. And I would add to that too, that the transformation of silence into language and action comes directly out of the knowledge of having breast cancer. Mm -hmm. So these pieces that we can talk about now, the, the essays primarily, come out of Lord's experiential realities. She experienced these things, she wrote about them, and theorized her body in, in relation to them. I think, too, um, just in terms of being able to speak not only for herself, but for a larger community by 1979, she was also um, a keynote speaker at the National March on Washington for Lesbian and Gays. That was the first one mm -hmm. in 1979. And at this point, she then has the floor because she is the Black lesbian voice. And she is able to stand forward and bring that voice in a way that no one else could have. Mm -hmm. So I think the combination of these writings that come from experiential knowledges and this persona as a public speaker, as a public intellectual, really shapes her legacy for us. It, well, it shapes her legacy for me. And one of the things I learned um, about myself, and I, I would always say that I learned, I think, a lot more about myself than I thought that I would going into the process of writing that biography. Mm -hmm. a poet. But I think one of the things I learned really is, sh is shaped by Lord's gift to us of, of knowing that we have nothing to lose. Mm -hmm. We have nothing to lose. And so we have to stand forward and we have to be able to speak. As she says in her poem, Litany for Survival, it is better to speak knowing we were never meant to be here. Mm -hmm. We were never meant to survive. Mm -hmm. So when we think about this 401 years, 401 years that we have been in struggle yes. in this hemisphere, when we think about that, then we know how much power we actually have. And I think that's what Lord was addressing as well, that we have power. Mm -hmm. However we identify, we have power. And, you know, you raise a good point that she demonstrated this understanding that we have nothing to lose. And yeah. I don't think enough of us realize that, that there is really nothing to lose, especially, I think, when you're a Black queer woman. Mm -hmm. like you're, mm -hmm. The world is already against you in mm -hmm. every way possible. So why not say something? Why mm -hmm. not do something? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, an, that's a, a, an amazing observation, one I'm certainly going to be thinking about for some time. Mm 
And we mm -hmm. saw that too, like um, she wrote a, a, an address at um, Hunter College called Difference in Survival. Yes. And uh, you see her poking at that idea uh, mm -hmm. in that essay. Well, it was really a talk, but it's mm -hmm. here as an essay. Uh, mm -hmm. You really see her demonstrating, you know, this is what you can do when you have nothing to lose. Yes. And I thought that, you know, we use the word empowering way too much and it has become diluted. But I do think that what she was doing was incredibly empowering because we oftentimes think we can't do anything because we have nothing, because the world sees us as nothing. Mm -hmm. And she gave us so many examples mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. how we can mm -hmm. actually work mm -hmm. against that narrative. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, I totally agree. And I would also add to that too, that her ability to articulate a theory of difference mm -hmm. is, is something else that she left to us to understand what difference does and why difference is something that we have to address, why we cannot uh, undertake any projects around sameness. Mm -hmm. Because sameness doesn't, doesn't do the work of the human project of evolving. Mm -hmm. Sameness simply puts us in a state of, of not interrogating. And one of the things she, she highlights, and actually more than one of her works, is that difference is not a weakness. Difference is actually a strength. Absolutely. Absolutely. What was the most unexpected thing you learned about her life? Because, you know, we, know, we, we have the person that we think we know through their work. And then when you spend a decade writing someone's biography and you're going to learn some unexpected things, what was the most unexpected thing you found? Um, that's a good question, Roxanne. I, I think in, in trying to, to interrogate this human project or this humanizing project, I think I really had to address what became these sort of competing truths about Audre Lorde. Mm -hmm. um, that she was both, for example, generous with other writers and also highly competitive with some of her peers. That she was, um, a woman who understood her own erotics and was something of a womanizer. That she was um, deeply public and deeply private. Mm -hmm. That she um, really worked against the notion of her own erasure mm -hmm. in continuing to write and write and write and write and write. And that she did something, to paraphrase Tony K. Bambara, mm -hmm. she was her own black. Yeah. She was her own black. She was not somebody else's version of black. And she struggled to articulate that and to press that notion of herself forward. And by struggle, I mean, you know, similar to, to what you're saying, was the the Mary the Mary Daly letter to to really stand up in in ways that meant that she was also going to suffer mm -hmm. and I mean there's a whole whole lot we can say about her Ma Mary Daly but the, <laughs> <laughs> and I do that in the biography so but the point that I want to really address is this idea of Lord's life and work positioning what we now call intersectionality. Yes. And that um, when we look to those who have come before us, we have to, especially Black women writers, whom we don't tend to think of as theorizing if they are not working in a particular academic way. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think that Lord was creating philosophy mm -hmm. as well as, as theory, uh, both in the prose and the poetry. And that's why the reader is such a smart volume because it will, it brings together uh, what you've called a life work 
And it also gives readers, new readers, old readers, an opportunity to track the ways in which Lord made philosophy or philosophized and the ways in which she theorized being black, feminist, lesbian, mother, poet, warrior. Mm -hmm. you, um, you touch on something that I think is so important when we talk about the work of black women and black women public intellectuals, which is that the work is scholarship and that mm -hmm. she does contribute to a, you know, to a, a history of intellectualism that generally tries to keep black women out yes. and does not honor yes. their work as intellectual, yes. um, sees yes. it as, you know, personal and raw, uh, yes. which people think is a compliment, but not really. And um, to see that her work is, at least in some institutions, being considered and, and treated as theory and philosophy is incredibly yes. important. It's yes. just incredibly, incredibly important. Yes. Yes. Is that what you want? Um, is that how you want the reader to be viewed? Uh, you know, that's a good question. And the answer is yes and no. Yes, because I believe that she belongs in that echelon of public thinking. Um, I say no because I don't know that acceptance in those areas and acceptance by those rules, which are patriarchal and full of white supremacy, like, is that really the goal? And so on the one hand, yes, she belongs there, but are they worthy of her? And like, is the respectability politics when we contort ourselves to be accepted by intellectuals um, who would otherwise look down on our work. So I, I struggle there, I do. But at the same time, I'm like, you, you damn well better consider that her there. But I want her to be seen both as a theorist and also just as an incredible writer because quite frankly, academic writing on the whole is terrible. It is boring and dry. And um, frankly, it doesn't say much of anything. Her work is not that. And so uh, it is definitely meant for a broader audience than just academ academia. But I do hope it's adopted in classes because mm -hmm. I think that there's plenty for students to get from that from the book. Okay, I, I think though those are good points. I think it's also important that I kind of break open that language a little bit because <laughs> when I talk about philosophy and when I talk about theory, I am not talking about patriarchal notions of philosophy Good. and patriarchal yeah. notions of theory. I am talking about the work that black women do. Mm -hmm. As you know, Barbara Christian said in the 1980s in her piece, The Race for Theory, black people do theorize. That's oh, what we sure. do. You know, we do that in everything we do, everything we write, um, the ways in which we speak, the ways in which we dress. So I think that there are um, ways in which we practice notions of uh, what can be called philosophy, mm -hmm. and practice notions of theorizing that exist as an otherwise, what, what um, uh, Ashon Crawley calls an otherwise possibility mm -hmm. as an alternative uh, to these these more patriarchal systems of thought and systems of, of, of knowledge. So, and I think it's important to, to note that we do have alternative realities. Black people, as, as, as I understand us, we do live in, a, in an alternate reality in this society. We always have because we have been uh, identified as Black and we have always um, had to construct our own epistemologies. Yeah, I agree. Um, and I think that's a useful breaking open. Uh, it's important not to make the assumption that we are talking about the patriarchal. And I think that's just how inculcated we are in the certain schools of thinking that we think, ah, that's what we're talking about. When no, we're talking yeah. about a whole separate thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we're talking about Audrey Lord. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, tell me, um, 
because we talked about how long it took me to do the biography warrior poet how long did you work on this project of the selected works i think at least a year and a half mm -hmm. uh, at least a year and a half and mm -hmm. once i made the selections things moved quickly uh -huh. but it took a long time for me to make the selections it took at least a year to uh -huh. because i wanted to be thorough and mm -hmm. I, I i like many people i'm over committed and have too much going on but I didn't want to half-ass this. And so mm -hmm. I took mm -hmm. the time I needed. And fortunately, mm -hmm. Norton was really good about mm -hmm. not pressuring me. And mm -hmm. um, they made all of the work available to me, uh, mm -hmm. which was great. So I didn't have to like go hunting it down. They had yeah. it ready to yeah. go. Um, and so, yeah, it took a year. And I started with the prose because that was um, the work of hers with which I was most familiar. So mm -hmm. I think it was great to just revisit it. And so much of it was connecting to a project I'm currently working on that it ended up being, like I said at the beginning, just so much more useful to me than I think I was to the project. Mm -hmm. I got so much out of it. And mm -hmm. then I read through her poetry, some of which I had read before, but mm -hmm. certainly not to this extent, mm -hmm. especially some of her earlier poetry and yeah. her later poetry. I think like many people, I read most of the stuff that she had generated in the 70s and 80s. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I just stayed with the poems and I love reading poetry. It's a kind of like a break from the world. And mm -hmm. so I would just read, you know, a handful of poems and then like really think about them. And I would make notes to myself as to which ones stood out to me, uh, which ones I, I might want to include and just little, very brief notes to myself as to why, so that when I was done, I could go back to the beginning and remember like what I was thinking at the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it was actually a lot of fun. So can you talk a little bit about, um, cause you talked about making the prose selections and the reader is, is um, structured so that we get the 12 or so essays that are the prose. Yes. And then we get the selections from her multiple uh, collections of, 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 of poetry. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that a little bit? Because one of the things I noticed was you didn't break up the po prose into Zami and mm -hmm. Sister Outsider and the Cancer Journals. No. For example. Yes. With the prose, I just wanted to sort of tell a story with a beginning and an end. And mm -hmm. I love poetry is not a luxury. Mm -hmm. I think it's the work of hers that I'm most familiar with. I think it's one of the most important ones because again, it's like making herself known, identifying the kind of black she is and making clear that poetry is not something that's frivolous. It's not something that mm -hmm. we need to make special space for. It's a necessity. And mm -hmm. because so much of the work is poems, I thought it was really important to start out with, let's make clear what we're talking about when we're talking about poetry, that poetry is a tool for change mm -hmm, and that mm -hmm. poetry is radical and necessary. Mm -hmm. And um, then how do you build on that? I think a lot of times as writers, we know what to do to bring attention to a problem. We know what to do to get you to care, but what do you do next? And so the transformation of silence into language and action felt like the next logical place to go because if poetry is this tool for change what do you do next and i love that she took some time in her work to to say like this is what action might look like mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. then it goes into some personal work with my mother's mortar and the uses mm -hmm. of the erotic mm -hmm. and the uses of the erotic again it's like poetry is not a luxury that the erotic is not frivolous the erotic is not this thing that we should not take seriously and um so I wanted to include that because I believe we have to take it seriously. And then with the master's tools, we'll never dismantle the master's house. It's sort of getting to the middle of what I see as the narrative. And that is whether, no matter how people have misinterpreted it over the years, that is one of her most well-known works. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to put the entire essay in and so people could realize it's not just that line. Mm -hmm. And here's what she's saying mm -hmm. before and after mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. very well-known line. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, talking about sexism and 
talking about sexism and with uh, sexism uh, and American disease and blackface. She's really talking about sexism from a black woman's perspective, which I think is a unique perspective. And as you were, were pointing out earlier, like she was doing intersectionality before we had that term and that language for it. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was so important because we need to understand that intersectionality is actually not new. And right. um, that people have talked about it and theorized it for many years now. And Kimberly Crenshaw gave us some very specific language to move forward with, but the ideas have been there. Yes. And then of course, I think anger is so important. Mm -hmm. And we mm -hmm. always, you know, people are always trying to diminish and, and temper their anger. And I think anger is incredibly healthy. And I think mm -hmm. that we should be angry. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to use the uses of anger. Mm -hmm. And then just some of, again, getting into more of the personal work, certainly living with cancer. You can't write about her life without writing about the impact that cancer had on her. Absolutely. Then, um, is your hair still political? Because throughout her work you see these questions of what is and what isn't political what can and what not, what can we not fight for and then bringing it to a close with difference and survival because we have to be able to survive all of this mm -hmm. and uh so i thought that was a useful place to bring the prose to an end and then mm -hmm. move into the poetry mm -hmm. yeah i can i can i can definitely see that as as you were outlining that just now i was thinking Audre Lorde was 58 when she left this life. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty young by mm -hmm. uh, contemporary standards. So in some ways, she, as a physicality, remains in that place of being young mm -hmm. and having left us at a, at a young time in life. And I'm wondering what you think about that as a black writer, as a black queer woman, in terms of the kind of work that your work stands on. I would certainly say that my own work stands on as well. Uh, what, it, what, it mean, what does it mean to produce a life that way? You know, that's a Good question. And it's one I think that I'm still figuring the answers out to. Mm -hmm. And, it's, you know, I'm 45. And so I would like to believe I have a good portion of my life ahead of me. Mm -hmm. And that I really hope my best writing is ahead of me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because, mm -hmm. you know, every day I, I learn more. And so, you know, that's a good question for which, you know, I, I think the answer is in process. I'm trying to figure out mm -hmm. sort of what mm -hmm. you make of this, what do you make mm -hmm. of a writing life? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Especially for black women who, you know, our longevity is not guaranteed. Mm -hmm. and there mm -hmm. is a lot against us. And I think that's one of the things that Lord's passing at 58 really showed so many of us that mm -hmm. we already know that we're marginalized, but as we see an increase public discourse more and more, we're marginalized in the healthcare realm as well. And mm -hmm. so we always have to write as if the world doesn't care about us because mm -hmm. we just don't know how much time we have left. Mm -hmm. um, and if I take anything from her work, I, I certainly would take that. Mm -hmm. What about you? Um, I have been blessed to be on this planet. I'm in my seventh decade now. Oh my goodness. Yes, baby. <laughs> <laughs> That's what's up. Yes. Yeah, I'm <laughs> blessed. So I feel like longevity um, has been a gift to me. Mm -hmm. uh, one that I um, cherish. I think I started cherishing in my 50s, actually. And um, some good friends of mine, uh, good mentors, good mother figures who are writers have also left. Mm. June Jordan, Tony K. Bambera, uh, James Baldwin, uh, Tony Morrison, uh, Jane Cortez. These, were, these are all uh, writers who grew me up. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like I, um, 
I, I, I'm not carrying them. I feel like they're with me. They're, yeah. uh, they're actually carrying me, basically. <laughs> they're carrying me forward. And so I feel a responsibility to the fact that they're carrying me forward to keep writing. Mm -hmm. uh, not because I am interested primarily in, primarily in publishing, but because I think it's important to, to write myself into these narratives, mm -hmm. the narratives of this country, the narratives of capitalism, the nar narratives of the global moments, the narratives of the pandemics we are suffering, the narratives of queerness, the narratives of blackness. It's really what has been given to me is like the pens that I have, the collection of pens that I have. These have been given to me as pens. Mm -hmm. So I have to write them because the stories are in the pens, in the pens, quote unquote, that the, that the ancestors have given me. So I have to um, write them, Octavia Butler. I have to write these things. Uh, again, not so, much to, not so much to be published, but to have a record. Yes. To have a record. And I think um, that's one of the things, and we should not forget, Audre Lorde studied library science. Mm -hmm. So she knew something about archiving. Yes. And um, she kept everything because she knew something about keeping a record. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's something that you and I are passing on, passing forward is the importance of keeping a record. And I don't think that the importance of leaving that record can be overstated mm. because so much of our record has been erased. Yes. And there are so many of our lives that go unrecognized and yeah. untold. Um, yeah. You know, I too, I do, I, publishing is great. I'm excited, you know, I'm so thrilled where, about where my career has gone, but I've said it many times, I would write regardless. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. You know, I write because I have something to say. And, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, I think nobody else can write from my point of view. Nobody else can write like you're from, mm -hmm. nobody else can write from your point of view. And certainly mm -hmm. nobody else can write from Audre Lorde's point of view. Uh, and it's just so important to remember that, um, that our points of view matter and the records yes. that we matter, the yes. archives that we create matter. I remember a couple of years ago, some university asked me for my archive. Mm. And I was like, what the fuck are you talking about? I don't have an archive. I'm, <laughs> I live on the internet. My shit is on my computer. Excuse my language. <laughs> but ever since that day, I've started saving things because I thought, huh, mm. all right, I guess someone someday will want. Yes. To yeah. maybe look through my nerdy yeah. papers. Yeah. Uh, and I, I, now I'm, I want every woman, no matter what, mm -hmm. to uh, keep an archive to, you know, we, we were here. We were alive. Our yes. lives mattered. Yes. Yes. And our archives, I totally agree with you, Roxanne. Roxanne. And I will add to that, that our archives are our papers, yes, but they are also the aesthetics of our lives. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, one of the things, unfortunately, we've suffered as Black people um, is not knowing to keep things. Mm -hmm. So when someone dies, we bag their stuff up into a Black plastic black bag and put it on the curb to be picked up as trash. Mm -hmm. And we have lost so many stories that way. So many stories. I mean, there, there is an archive in the clothing that we wear from decade to decade, mm -hmm. which is why I really support the work of uh, Black designers and um, Black people who went to style and who, you know, promote style on social media, blah, 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 because that is too a kind of text that we have. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's important. Yes, you're absolutely right. Um, we should keep archives of, of, of our papers and sort of things like that. But we should also really understand uh, what an archive can include. 
you I've never even considered that. Hmm. That the archive can include more than books and papers and the ephemera yeah. around the writing process. That never would have occurred to me. I love that. Mm. Mm. You're so welcome. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> What is one thing you want to include in your archive that people would not expect to find there? Uh, I think I would want to include my pens and my ink bottles mm. because I write by hand. I write with fountain pen and I use notebooks. I use those black and white composition notebooks so, and I love pens. I love pens. I love ink on my hands. Mm -hmm. I love to get up from my table and discover that the ink is actually all over my fingers. It's not, wasn't just in my pen. So I think I would like to leave my pens in my ink because I think so many of us have moved on to the computer mm -hmm. as the writing tool. Mm -hmm. And that's okay for those of us who do that. Um, but I think someone is gonna to come to my archive um, after I'm gone and say, oh my God, look at these pens. Mm -hmm. Look at these, look at these, you know, instruments. Look at these old school things. And so, um, and I would wanna say by, by having my pens in my archive, that writing is a visceral experience. Mm -hmm. I would wanna say that it came out of my body that way because I had to use my, my good left hand and, and my pens in order to, to bring those stories forward. Mm -hmm. Excellent. I can't believe you write by hand. Ugh. Yes. <laughs> I, I admire it. I can't do it. Well, you know what? I can't write by computer. Yeah. You know, I think, it, I think you find the thing that works for you. Absolutely. Um, yeah, um, I try to take notes sometimes by hand because mm -hmm. it's actually easier for me to read handwritten notes and have a notebook next to me than mm -hmm. to open up like separate files and yeah and all that. But yeah, writing is such that I have yeah. to type it out. Yeah, um, I don't know if you've had a chance to to go to Spelman and and to visit the Lord Archives there. Not yet. But when you do, not if you do, when you do, you'll see her notebooks and you'll see Lord's handwriting. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is a wonderful experience. I was just, um, I was actually privileged to go through that material mm -hmm. while I was doing the biography and before it was open to the public. And I was amazed by the experience of actually seeing this poet's handwriting. Amazing. Yeah, and I think that that is an art form, being able to write by hand, mm -hmm. um, and also a way of, of being that in, after this time, I don't wanna just say the future, but after this time will probably exist less and less mm -hmm. as we we humans develop these technologies um, and, and computers are only the beginning, I think. Mm -hmm. um, oh, we have a lot of questions. Okay. So let us see. Um, I'm curious if you both have memories of the first time you read Audre Lorde, Audre, I keep doing that, Audre Lorde, where were you, how did you feel, et cetera? Huh. That's hard for me to answer because I steeped myself in Lord in, in writing that biography for those 10 years. So, I mean, the first time I heard her work, I heard her read it as a poet. Um, we, there were, I had opportunities in which we were on the same program. So I got to hear Miss Lord read her poetry. And that was my first experience with her work was hearing her read. And like many of the other women in her audiences being just completely mesmerized mm -hmm. by that voice 
coming out of that body, um, coming out of that attitude, coming out of that Caribbean-ness. <laughs> um, so yeah, so hearing her read was my first experience with her work. But if I had to really pick one work, I would say it was the Cancer Journals. I, I would have to say it was the Cancer Journals. And I was living in Brooklyn, New York at the time because the Cancer Journals came out, what, 1980? 80, 82, something like that. And I was living in Brooklyn and everyone was reading the Cancer Journals. Mm -hmm. It was the first manifesta, if you will, on uh, cancer as articulated by a black lesbian, by, you know, just by a black woman and a black woman who is also a lesbian. Mm -hmm. And that was a groundbreaking work and everyone was reading it. Everyone was reading it. You couldn't go to a black woman's house, and a black not, woman well, who identified as lesbian and not see a copy of the cancer journals. Mm -hmm. What about you? I, for, I don't know the exact age, but I was in my early twenties mm -hmm. and I had come out at 19 mm -hmm. and I didn't have any angst over it. I, I've never had any angst over my sexuality, which, you know, thank God I've got mm -hmm. enough going on. But mm -hmm. she was one of the first, if not the first writer I ever read, who was not only a Black woman, because I had read Toni Morrison, Alice Walker mm -hmm. at the point, mm -hmm. but I had mm -hmm. never read a Black queer woman or mm -hmm. a, a Black queer woman who was out. Mm -hmm. And to read her being so unapologetically Black and lesbian, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was just like, oh, I there is a space in this world for me and my voice. Mm -hmm. And um, it was just, I can't begin to express how impactful it was. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, like we, we talk about how representation matters mm -hmm. and it really, really does. Mm -hmm. It really does. Mm -hmm. And to be able to have that um, meant so very much to me. And it still does. I, I just mm -hmm. think what she did was such an amazing gift and she didn't even know she was giving it to most of us. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I feel that way about Zami too. Yes. Yeah. And I, that was one of the first things of hers I ever read. And yeah. I love that um, she reinvented language because language could not accommodate what she wanted mm -hmm. to do, what she wanted to call her book. And so Absolutely. she was like, you know what? I will make my own terms here. Right. That, I mean, that's baller. That is yeah. just baller. Yeah. 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 For, for me, that book um, is a masterwork. Mm -hmm. It's just one of Lord's masterpieces. And I, I think she has a few others. But that one um, really situated Lord for me in the category of genius, mm -hmm. black genius, actually, mm -hmm. the way we think about black genius, because it really, as you pointed out, she creates language and she also cre creates this narrative that had not existed in terms of um, a good ending for a black lesbian. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't um, fraught with uh, notions of suicide, et cetera, mm -hmm. that were more prevalent in the lesbian narratives before the 1980s, before Lord, before the 1970s. Those narratives that came out of the 40s and 50s, for example, that were shaped by closets and angst, to use your term and violence and and here is lord creating this lush reality in zami that's simply amazing let's see um, Are there any other questions we have many other questions okay uh are we gonna have time oh oh we're out of time <laughs> Well then, 
just has been an honor and an amazing opportunity to be able to talk about Aubrey Lord's work. Um, yeah, that's all I have to say. It's just been amazing. I am so happy to have had this opportunity, Roxanne, to get to see you in person, to listen to you, to, to share notes on this remarkable ancestor of ours now, mm -hmm. and to be present in this 2020 moment as, as we go forward. Thank you, and, and thank you for your work on Audrey Lord and um, stay in it, baby. Uh, you too, you too. All right. All right. Have a great okay. evening. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.